So far, everything we've done has assumed that the functions behave well. We've said, if f of x is represented by a Taylor series, then what's the formula? And if f of x and g of x are represented by a Taylor series, what can we say about f of x plus g of x, or f of x times g of x, or f of x divided by g of x? And what's the Taylor series for sine and cosine and e to the x? But now we're going to ask the question, does it really work? You know, if I give you a function and you compute its Taylor series, is it, going to, is it accurate? Suppose we take the, just the first n terms. You know, what is the error? You know, it's not going to give you the exact answer because you need infinitely many terms to get the exact answer. How big of an error do you have if you only take n terms? So a little terminology. We're going to let tn of x be the first n terms of the Taylor series of a function. Okay? And of course, we want the coefficients to be the kth derivative divided by k factorial. It's just the usual Taylor series, except we're only cutting it off. We're cutting it off after nth n terms. So this is sometimes called an this is sometimes called an nth order Taylor polynomial. A Taylor series is when you take an infinite sum. A Taylor polynomial is when you only take a finite number of terms. And we're going to let Rn, the nth remainder, be what's left over when you subtract off the nth order Taylor polynomial from f of x. And what we'd like to have happen, we'd like to think that our function is given by an infinite series. But of course, an infinite series is a limit of a finite sum. That's what it means to add up an infinite number of terms. So this infinite series means the limit of the Taylor polynomials. In other words, we're hoping that when n is big, tn of x is close to f of x. In other words, what we'd like is when n is big, we'd like the remainder to be as small as possible. And the question we have is how many terms do you need until the remainder is small. And this is answered by Taylor's theorem with remainder. So Taylor's theorem says that if you've got a function that's k plus 1 times differentiable, for some reason I switched from n times differentiable to k times differentiable, it doesn't matter. k plus 1 times differentiable on an interval, and if you have a point on the interval, then this is a formula for the remainder. The remainder after you subtract off the first k terms, looks just like the k plus first term, except that instead of taking the k plus first derivative at a, you take the k plus first derivative at a mystery point, at some point z that is between a and x. The theorem doesn't tell you where the point is. It just says there is a point between z and x where this works. Now, that means that if you know that the derivative is, isn't too big, if you know that the k plus first derivative is always less than some number, let's call it m, then even if you have no idea where this point z is, you know that fk plus 1 of z has got to be uh, m or less, and so the remainder term has to be given by this expression or less. And with that in hand, we can prove things like that the series for sine converges. Because, of course, all of the derivatives of sine are either sine or cosine or minus sine or minus cosine, and they're all one or smaller. So if you write down the Taylor series for the sine function, the remainder term is bounded by 1 times x to the k plus 1 over k plus 1 factorial. And no matter how big x is, as, you, as k plus 1 gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, this term gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So the remainder gets smaller, and our series gets closer and closer and closer to the true function. This is what we'd like to see for lots of things. Now, I should remind you of an old theorem we had that has the same kind of flavor as Taylor's theorem. Remember, Rolle's theorem says that if you have a function that's 0 here and 0 here, let's call this a and b, then somewhere in the middle, the derivative had to be 0. Rolle's theorem didn't tell us where the derivative had to be 0. It just said there is some point z between a and b where the derivative has to be 0. 
And we also had the, inter the mean value theorem. And it said, if you've got a function, and it takes on the value, two different values at A and B, and you have to assume that the function is continuous in the closed interval and differentiable in the open interval, then there's a point Z somewhere between A and B, such that the derivative at Z is the average rate of change between B and A. And if you multiply both sides by B minus A, that's another way of saying that F of B is F of A plus B minus A times F prime of Z. In fact, this is Taylor's theorem zeroth order. It says this is the zeroth order Taylor polynomial. The remainder term is given by B minus A times the derivative at some point between A and B. So let's see why uh, Taylor's theorem works. So our setup is we'll let TK, TK of X be the kth order Taylor polynomial. And we're doing it around a point A. And we're working on an interval from A to B. Okay. And so the, the jth coefficient is just, just going to be the jth derivative at A divided by J factorial. And then the remainder, the RK, is going to be the true function minus the kth order polynomial. And I'm going to define a new number. I'm going to call it S. It's going to be the remainder at B divided by B minus A to the K plus 1. And the purpose of that is that we can then define a new function, G of X. It's going to be the original function minus the Taylor polynomial and minus this one extra term. We pick the value of S so that G of B is 0. Because G of B is going to be F of B minus the Taylor polynomial of B, so this is R of B, minus S times B minus A to the K plus 1, which is RK of B. So everything cancels, and G of B is 0. But likewise, G of A is 0, because the uh, value of the polynomial equals the value of the function at A, and the derivative matches, and the second derivative matches, and the third derivative matches, so in fact, G of A and all of its first K derivatives match at A. Sorry, F and T, all of their first K derivatives match at A. That's how we got the Taylor polynomial. And the first K derivatives of this function at A are all zero. So we have a function that's zero at A and zero at B. And its derivative is zero at A. And its second derivative is zero at A. And its K derivative is zero at A. So now we can dredge out Rolle's theorem. Rolle's theorem says, hey, g of a was 0 and g of b was 0, so there has to be some point in between them where the derivative is 0. And then we use Rolle's theorem again. g prime of a is 0 and g prime of z1 is 0. We apply Rolle's theorem to g prime, so there has to be a point, another point between a and z1 where the derivative of g prime is 0. In other words, g double prime is 0. And then we find a point between a and z2 where g triple prime is 0 because g double prime of a is 0, g double prime of z2 is 0. And so somewhere in between, g triple prime is 0. And we keep going. We finally get a point z between a and our zk such that the k plus first derivative of z there is 0. But the k plus first derivative is the k plus first derivative of f. The k plus first derivative of the, of the polynomial is, is 0 because all the terms were x to the k or less. And then the last term, the k plus first derivative, is just k plus 1 factorial times s. And this we said was 0. So S must be the K plus first derivative at Z divided by K plus 1 factorial. Okay. In other words, 0 was G of B. That's F of B minus TK of B minus our remaining term. And we plug in the value of S. And we get this. 
and that tells us the remainder at B was given by this expression. Now, I did this whole proof thinking about B, but this is good for all values of B. So if instead of calling it B, we call the point where this equation worked X, we get Taylor's theorem. The remainder at X is given by this whole expression, the k plus first derivative at z divided by k plus 1 factorial times x minus a to the k plus 1, where z is not just between a and b, it's between a and x. Now, throughout all this, I assumed that b was bigger than a. You can do the same kind of calculation on the other side, and the proof is similar, and I won't bore you with the details.